let's go ahead and get started. We are truly getting down to it. Uh, we are down to our last lecture of the muscle system, part uh, three of this section. So uh, we finish up a little bit of our muscle physiology, a little bit more explanation on what's going on with skeletal muscle. And then we'll finish things up with a discussion of a smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, what we remember and add a little to that. Uh, I'll same thing with the uh, lab. We have a little bit more to work through the muscles of our legs. Uh, and again, all of this shouldn't take most of uh, the whole class today. So we hopefully will have time at the end for a review, which again is not me telling you what I think is important, uh, but you asking questions about what you're unclear about so we can make sure you understand it for the exam, which is happening in two days. And then uh, no rest, we dive right back in right after that with the nervous system. So, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Up to this point, I think you have uh, learned what you believe to be everything you ever could possibly know about skeletal muscle fibers and more. Uh, but it turns out uh, there's a little bit more to it than this. While we've been talking about skeletal muscle as a singular thing, as we've kind of hinted at, uh, it's not. The same way we could talk about cartilage as a singular thing, but then we found out that there was hyaline cartilage and elastic cartilage and fibrocartilage. The same thing is true for skeletal muscle fibers. While we talk about skeletal muscle as a singular thing, there are actually specific types. We've talked about uh, average rates of myosin heads. We've talked about and seen how some muscles twitch very fast, some muscles twitch very slow and stuff like that. So we've kind of hinted at these things, but as it turns out, there are basically three main types of skeletal muscle fibers. Of course, we need to be able to distinguish them from each other. Uh, so one of the main ways we do that is by the size of the muscle cell in diameter. And notice when we talk about uh, diameter, in parentheses here, it says strength of contraction. Why would the diameter of a muscle cell affect the strength of the contraction? Uh, the larger the diameter, the stronger the contraction. Why? You're absolutely correct. But why does a larger in diameter muscle cell, why is it stronger than a, a smaller in diameter one? Uh, more muscle fibers, more cells. Well, but again, both of these are just one cell. We're not talking about muscle organs. We're talking about a muscle cell. You're on the right track. What is the difference between this muscle cell and this muscle cell? more mitochondria true one of the things that it could have is more mitochondria but that's probably more not the, uh, exactly right again typically cells are thicker in diameter because they're going to have more myofibrils more myofibrils mean more sarcomeres more sarcomeres mean more myosin heads and as we know, it is the number of myosin heads that are able to perform their power strokes that determines the strength of the contraction. So a muscle cell that is larger in diameter has more myosin heads in it, and so it's going to be stronger in its contraction. Excellent. Remember, we talked about how the average myosin head performs a power stroke five times in a second. But we also said that was an average, which means there are some that are faster and some that are slower. And in particular, there are primarily two types of myosin heads, fast myosin heads and slow myosin heads. So fast myosin heads produce a fast contraction and slow myosin heads produce a slow contraction. What was myoglobin again? Stores oxygen. Yeah, that was that inclusion that we talked about inside of muscle cells that store oxygen. And again, we talked about how this is similar uh, to hemoglobin. And as we know, when oxygen binds to hemoglobin, what happens? What happens to our blood when oxygen binds to hemoglobin? Uh, 
gets taken out to the rest of the body. True, but you guys are overthinking this. What's the difference between, if I had a bucket here of oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood, what would be the difference between them? All right, you get a paper cut and you well up some blood on your finger and you look at that finger. How many people here have donated blood before? Couple of you, excellent. When you donate the blood, oh, there you go. Samuel's got it. Uh, well, getting closer. Um, when you donate the blood, right? Does that donated blood inside of that bag look the same as that blood that when you cut yourself? Why? It's separated. True, it will separate, but before it separates. Color. Color, there you go, exactly. Told you guys we're overthinking it. Absolutely, what happens when oxygen binds to the iron of the hemoglobin? Gets darker. Yeah, well, it gets brighter actually, it gets redder, right? It gets that bright red color. When oxygen binds to the iron, it gives it a reddish color. Well, myoglobin works in a similar way. Myoglobin, myoglobin also has an iron. And when the oxygen binds to that iron, it can give it a reddish color in that same way. So um, muscle cells can vary in the amount of myoglobin they have. And if they have a lot of myoglobin, then they will take on a very reddish color. Where if they have very little uh, myoglobin, the muscle cell will take on more of a whitish color. <clears throat> and as you guys mentioned, myoglobin stores oxygen. So a muscle cell that has a lot of myoglobin and has more of a reddish color also has lots of stored oxygen inside of it. Whereas a white cell that has very little myoglobin contains a very small amount of oxygen. Why might the amount of oxygen that in a muscle cell has stored inside of it be important? To create more energy. Right, it's gonna affect how it produces its energy, absolutely, right? Muscle cells can vary in their capillary supply. Some are well diffused getting lots of uh, blood to them very rapidly, and others have less of a blood supply. Why might the circulation to the muscle cells be significant? What's the blood good for? Nutrients, oxygen. There you go, nutrients, but again, It's definitely going to affect our ability to, when we're exercising, how rapidly we can get oxygen to those cells. Some muscle cells are going to have a large number of mitochondria. Some are going to have few mitochondria. Why would the amount of mitochondria be significant? More ATP. Right. Remember, they need to use oxygen to completely break down our glucose to produce ATP. All right, are you sensing a theme here? <clears throat> Basically, one of the major differences in muscle cells is how they're going to produce their ATP. Basically, if you have a lot of oxygen, access to a lot of oxygen, a lot of mitochondria, then you can primarily make ATP using oxygen, using aerobic respiration. And the use of aerobic respiration is a process we call oxidative ATP production. Those that don't have as much myoglobin, don't have as good of a blood supply, don't have as much mitochondria inside of it, are gonna have to primarily rely on making ATP without oxygen using anaerobic respiration, right? And so again, notice a lot of these factors involve whether you make ATP with oxygen or without oxygen.
And if you make ATP without oxygen, that is known as glycolytic ATP production. And as we also know, oxidative, as we've said, is very efficient, uh, but it is slow, right? Whereas our glycolytic, as we talked about, was quick and dirty. Right? It is a much faster way, but it is not nearly as efficient. We don't get nearly the ATP out of it. All right. Based on these characteristics, there are three main types of muscle fibers. And let's actually switch to the whiteboard to do this. So in a glycolytic system, uh, when you're, you know, it's making the ATP, but not very well, not as efficient. Um, is that when it'll start taking from adipose? Uh, not necessarily. I, I get where you're trying to go with that because we obviously fat burning is something that is important to us. Now, in this case, it really has to do more with uh, how long it's going to be able to sustain its contraction for. Where we mobilize the resources to get the fuel, uh, whether it's from breaking that glucose or whether it's breaking ATP, both of that have to basically uh, occur before it enters the mitochondria. So it isn't going to necessarily affect that. All right. As we know, there was a lot in the name. Fast glycolytic. These are, as it turns out, the most common. Let's make sure it all fits in here. Type of muscle cell are fast glycolytic. And uh, what we know about these are these are the largest in diameter. Now, being large in diameter tells us one other thing as well. What do we, if it's the largest in diameter, what else do we know about it? Strongest contraction. Yeah. Excellent. With a name like FAST, what do you think FAST refers to? The speed of the myosin heads? Yeah, exactly. So this contains FAST myosin. And of course, if it has FAST myosin heads, what does that tell us about the speed of the contraction? FAST contraction. So notice these fast glycolytic cells are able to produce a very fast and a very powerful contraction. However, there's the other half of their name, glycolytic. Being glycolytic means what? Uh, anaerobic respiration. Yeah. Exactly, primarily, primarily produces ATP uh, without oxygen. Now, knowing this, do you think that these cells have a large amount of myoglobin or a small amount of myoglobin? Small. Well. And in fact, these are the ones that we, as we mentioned before, are typically known as our white fibers because they don't have that pigment from the myoglobin in there as well. Are they typically going to have a uh, large capillary system or small capillary system? What do you think? Do they get a lot of oxygen while they're exercising? Yeah, small amount. Excellent. And what about the number of mitochondria? Small. Yeah. So notice 
This produces a fast, powerful contraction. But remember, it's not going to be efficient in the making of the ATP. So is it going to be able to sustain that contraction for a prolonged period of time? No. No. So these are muscle cells that are going to fatigue quickly. So we can produce a past powerful contraction, but not one that lasts for a long period of time. So these types of muscles are good for <clears throat> our fast, intense activities. Lifting that weight, throwing that ball, right? Kicking that bad guy, whatever, right? It's fast, rapid activities that are not sustained for a prolonged period of time. All right, and as I mentioned, these are our, oops, wrong button. Our white fibers. All right, questions on that? <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so it's it's the uh, activity you're doing, not the intensity of the activity you're doing, correct? Because like you could walk for a long time, but then you try to sprint and you're going to burn out quickly. Right. So these would be the cells that were used for the sprinting. These are not the muscle cells that would be used for the walking. Right. Aren't they the same muscle cells, just different intensity? No, see, that's what I'm getting at. What The same way that fibrocartilage and hyaline cartilage and elastic cartilage are all cartilages but are different from each other, muscle cells are the same way. They're, all of these are skeletal muscle cells, right? So we are talking about, and let's actually emphasize that. We'll grab this, move it down, grab this, move it down, grab this, move it down. The, these are all skeletal muscle cells. but there are th three main types. And these three main types are going to be useful for different types of activities. So as you mentioned, if we need to sprint, if we need to throw that ball or you know lift that weight or something like that, then our fast glycolytic muscle cells, skeletal muscle cells will be the ones we use for that. However, if we want to walk, right, maintain a slow pace for a prolonged period of time, we can use a different type of skeletal muscle cell. Conveniently enough, the next one we wanted to talk about, oops, doesn't need to be capitalized anymore, is slow oxidative. The slow oxidative, let's see if we can line this up are the smallest in diameter. And what does that tell us? Uh, produce a small contraction. There you go, exactly. Yeah, relatively weak contraction or the weakest contraction of all the types. A lot in the name, slow oxidative. What does the slow refer to? Uh, contractions. Myosin True. Heads. Yeah, exactly. Slow myosin heads, which you are absolutely correct, are going to produce a slow contraction. So notice this muscle cell produces a relatively uh, slow and weak contraction. Very, very different from the fast glycolytic that we just talked about. However, there's the other part of its name, oxidative. Which means what? Produces ATP with oxygen. Exactly. It primarily... Really? Produces ATP aerobically, which of course means with 
oxygen. Now, if it is going to produce ATP with oxygen, how much myoglobin do we want in this muscle cell? Lots. Yeah. Right. As such, these are often referred to as the red fibers because they have a lot of that pigment inside of them. They're going to need a large uh, blood supply. to keep that oxygen flowing to them. And of course, with all that oxygen, they're also gonna need lots of mitochondria. So while these muscle cells produce a slower and a weaker contraction, they're much more efficient at producing ATP. So these muscle cells are gonna be fatigue resistant. So we're gonna be able to produce that contraction for a prolonged period of time. So you were talking about that walking or that standing, right? This is going to be good for, uh, you know, maintaining posture, walking, et cetera. These are good for activities. Let's say smaller, so I'm not using slow again. And again, these are what we refer to as our red fibers. Again, I know at first this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but it really does. You already knew this because Thanksgiving is right around the corner. All right, I know it's not really right around the corner, but it helps my story if it is right around the corner. And uh, what's the big question you always get asked at Thanksgiving? I mean, yeah, it's when are you going to have kids or when are you going to make grandkids, or when meat. are you going to get a job or all of those. But after all of those questions, then, yeah, Brian's got it, right? Do you want white meat or dark meat? Where is the white meat on a turkey? The breast. The breast and the wings. Where is the dark meat in the turkey? Thighs. Thighs Ooh. and the legs, right? Think about how a turkey lives. How does a turkey primarily get around? Flies around. Does a turkey primarily fly? Is that the primary way a turkey gets around? The legs. Yeah, he walks. Absolutely, they walk, they stand. Right, so they're able to stand, they're able to walk. Is a turkey capable of flight? Yes, but for short periods of time, it's not their primary way of getting around. How many people here have eaten duck before? Excellent, Jacob has, probably a couple other you of you have. Typically when you eat duck, you eat the breast of the duck. And what does that breast meat look like? I didn't hear you. It's dark. Yeah, it's a dark meat. Because what's the primary way that a duck gets around? Yeah, it flies. Absolutely. It's going to be flying. Sure. That's its primary nice. way of getting around. Yeah, it's capable of walking. It's capable of swimming. But it primarily gets around by uh, flight. So it's big fatigue resistant muscles are in its breast. So what are we? Are we turkeys or are we ducks? Turkeys. turkeys. Well, your turkeys, absolutely, right? As we talked about, how long can you stand for? Till you pass out. Yeah, well, pretty much till you pass out, exactly. How long can you hold yourself in a planking position for? A couple minutes. Yeah, a couple minutes, maybe something like that. Absolutely. And if you think about it, while you're planking, you're not even holding up all of your weight. So you can stand for an eight hour shift of waiting tables but you can't even plank, right, for five minutes. Can't holding up just a part amount of your weight, absolutely. Our white meat, like the turkey, tends to be up more towards the uh, arms and chest, whereas our dark meat tends to be down in the legs and the thighs. 
Absolutely. Now, it's not pure muscle. I will tell you right now that every single muscle in your body, with the exception of six, um, all are mixes of all three types. But yes, we tend to have more of the fast glycolytic in the upper body and more of the slow oxidative in the lower body. But notice there is also a third type as well. That third type is an interesting mix of the two where it is a fast oxidative. So, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So, a turducken? <laughs> no, 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 did you just ask if it was a turducken? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a great, that's a great question. I like that. I love that. No, I know. Uh, it's a nice mix of the two. You got the right idea, but not quite the traduction. That is great. Uh, absolutely. So again, obviously, a fast glycolytic is the largest, slow oxidative is the smallest. So these are going to be intermediate in size, which means they're going to produce an intermediate strength contraction. Again, based on the name, what is the speed of the myosin heads? Fast. Which of course is gonna give us a fast contraction. So again, it produces an intermediate strength fast contraction. And again, because anatomists hate us, this is a little bit tricky. It is oxidative, which of course, as we know, means that it is primarily going to produce ATP aerobically, which is normally what we think. But in this case, even though these are called oxidative cells, the trick with this fast oxidative is that they're equally able to produce ATP, both aerobically and anaerobically. So it actually is kind of a mix of the two. As such, it has an intermediate amount of myoglobin. And so that means they're not quite white, but they're not quite red. What does that make these? Pink. Yeah, these are our pink fibers. Excellent. Intermediate in their capillary system and an intermediate amount of mitochondria. Because they have some ability to produce ATP aerobically, that makes them fatigue resistant. Um, and so these are going to be good for moderate activities. Things like jogging, uh, things like uh, leisurely swimming in a pool. I'm not talking about the doing laps, but just like a leisurely swim in a pool or a jog or things along those lines. And these, of course, as I mentioned, are our pink fibers. All right, we've done this here. Let's go back here. So our fast glycolytic, the most common type, large in diameter, these are our white cells because they have very little uh, myoglobin inside of them. Few mitochondria produce their ATP anaerobically, fast contraction. And just like that Hummer, if you're not gonna be efficient, if you only get two miles to a gallon, right? You can't get away with a 10 gallon tank, right? Does a Hummer have a 10 gallon gas, gas can? 
No, absolutely not. You wouldn't be able to get from gas station to gas station. So we need a big fuel supply in that if you're not going to be able to produce ATP efficiently. And like we talked about, this is good for fast, intense movements that are not maintained. Our slow oxidative, smallest in diameter, largest amount of myoglobin, making them our red cells, produce their ATP aerobically, but have those slow myosin heads, right? Very efficient in their production of their ATP, producing slow, weaker contractions. So again, this is very good for uh, standing or walking, things that we can do for hours on end. And then our fast oxidative, our intermediate in diameter, intermediate in color, able to produce ATP equally aerobically and anaerobically, have fast myosin heads, but are fatigue resistant. And these are used for, like I said, more intermediate type of activities. So all of our muscles except six. There are six muscles that you haven't had to learn for this exam, but I will warn you, you are going to learn for the nervous system exam. And they are the six muscles that move your eye through space, up, down, left, right, and all around. The muscles that move your eye through space are actually the only true muscles in your body. They are made 100% of fast glycolytic fibers. Right, And you kind of knew that because you haven't thought of it before, but as you know, if you stare at your phone or stare at your textbook or stare at something else that you keep close to your face, a book back in ancient times when we used to read those, uh, for long periods of time, one of the things that starts to happen is you start to get that kind of eye strain right, where it starts to hurt up here by the ridge. And that's because you're constantly contracting those muscles to stare at that phone or to stare at that textbook or to stare at that leisurely book you're reading. And those muscle cells fatigue rapidly as a result of it. That's why they recommend when you're reading a book or you're working on the computer to look up and away for a while to rest some of those muscles in your eyes, allowing them both inside the eyes and outside the eyes to relax. But Every other muscle besides those muscles that we have in uh, that move our eye through space are a mix of all three types. And we can see, well, here's the pretty uh, chart from your textbook that shows that, but here's a pretty picture. Here we have a cross section through a single fascicle. And this particular stain is a stain that stains for myoglobin. So notice here, we can see that some of these muscle cells have a large amount of myoglobin in them. Those are, of course, our slow oxidative. Some have an intermediate amount of myoglobin. Those are the fast oxidative. And some of these have almost no myoglobin in it, which gives it that very lightish, whitish coloration to it. Here, we're looking inside of a single fascicle. Here, we're looking at a cross-section through a muscle with several fascicles. And again, we can see some of these are the little to no myoglobin. Some have an intermediate amount of myoglobin. And some are very, very dark with myoglobin. So we can see that all of these are a mix of the amount of myoglobin. Again, this is a special stain, just stains for myoglobin, allowing us to be able to see this. Now, while every muscle, almost every muscle in your body is a mix of these three types, does everybody have the same mix of muscle cells in their body? No. No, absolutely not, which is why if we all got together as we talked about at the beginning of this class and instead of studying anatomy and physiology, we worked out for four and a half hours a day and we all did the exact same amount of reps with the exact same amount of rep, the exact same number of days, would we all get the exact same amount of gain in muscle mass and strength as a result of that? No. No. So what determines the difference? Biology. Yeah, and more specifically, genetics, 
right? Primarily, some people are just genetically going to have more of one type than they are of another. But is it just that? No. No, the other part of it is going to be training as well. Yes, genetically, some people are going to have more of one type than another. But also, you get differences in use and practice. And one of the classic examples, again, with the Olympics coming up, is you can have a couple of uh, world-class athletes like Usain Bolt and good old Meb, right? Usain Bolt is a sprinter right? And looks basically like an Olympian god with big, huge, massive muscles that allow him to make those powerful, ras fast, um, rapid contractions of the muscles to be able to go that. And then you've got Meb, right? Who looks like he hasn't eaten in 16 weeks, right? But again, world-class marathon runner, right? Both are world-class athletes, but could Usain Bolt decide tomorrow that he wanted to be a marathoner and would he be a world-class marathoner? I mean, he might be able to with years of training, but is he going to be able to do it tomorrow? No, because he's basically spent his whole life uh, maximizing the efficiency of his uh, fast glycolytic muscle cells whereas a marathoner has been primarily uh, focusing on their slow oxidative, right? And a little bit of the converting of their fast glycolytic into fast oxidative to help them to sustain that speed. So there can be some conversion, especially from fast oxidative to fast, I mean, from fast glycolytic to fast oxidative. Uh, there can be some training, there can be some modification, but it also depends on what you're emphasizing and highlighting. Different activities work different types of muscle cells. All right, questions on that? Excellent, all right. With that, now we are finally done with skeletal muscle. Now you truly know everything you need to know about skeletal muscle. But we do need to come back and briefly talk about smooth muscle and cardiac muscle. Let's start easy. Tell me some of the things you know about smooth muscle tissue. Non striated. Spindle shape. Excellent. Non striated, spindle shape. Gliated. Lines, hollow organs. Hold on. Uh, uninucleated. Is there one more I heard? I, I, Involuntary. I I'm sorry? Involuntary. Ooh, I like that. All right. And being involuntary, how is it controlled? The autonomic uh, nervous system. And hormones. There we go. Excellent. Oh, let's go back. Hold on. Most lines, hollow organs, lines, walls of hollow organs. I can think of at least one more. Highest rate of regeneration. Excellent. That's what comes to mind for me. Am I missing anything? I guess the other thing when we talked about the, how they line the walls of the hollow organs, we said how they're arranged in layers or sheets. I think that's most of the stuff that we talked about already. So again, they're small, spindle-shaped, uh, uninucleated cells, absolutely. High repairability, lining the walls of our hollow organs, arranged in our layers or sheets. Excellent. Notice here in our small intestine, there are actually two different layers that have a different orientation to them. One goes around the circumference of the small intestine. And as we know, circular muscles can, can change the diameter of that. And the other are longitudinal, where they run the length of the tube. 
And so they're able to change the length, right? decrease or increase the length by contracting and relaxing. And it's these smooth muscle activities of, this, uh, of the digestive system, really, uh, rhythmic interaction between the circular and the longitudinal that propels substances through our digestive tract. And anyone know what the name of that fancy rhythmic alternating contraction system to propel food through the small intestine is called? or really the entire alimentary canal. It's okay if you haven't heard it yet. I was just curious if anybody knew it. Peristalsis? Yeah, there you go. Peristalsis, exactly. Peristalsis is that. Excellent. Perfect. All right. So those are things that we know. Again, non-striated and involuntary found in the walls of hollow organs. And I will, uh, I won't save it till the end like we did with skeletal muscle. Just like there are three specific types of skeletal muscle, there are two specific types of smooth muscle. The two types are single unit or visceral. This is the type that is found in the walls of the hollow organs. Right. So again, as we talked about, these are the ones that are arranged in sheets they are called single unit because they actually have gap junctions that connect them together. So again, I know these are spindle shaped uh, for simplicity. I'm just gonna draw them as lines here. So you have this row of smooth muscle cells that are all together in this layer in this sheet and there are gap junctions that connect these cells together. So that basically when our nervous system comes in and stimulates that first muscle cell, that action potential can spread to all the other ones so that they all work together as a single unit, right? That's why it's called single unit and visceral because it lines the hollow, it lines the walls of our visceral organs, of our hollow visceral organs inside of our abdominal pelvic cavity. And what's actually interesting is some of these can also be autorhythmic have the ability to produce their own action potential, right? As we've talked about, you find this in your digestive system. You had that nice big cheeseburger for breakfast. And when your cheeseburger hit your stomach, did you have to tell your stomach, all right, stomach start churning, it's time to get to work on breakfast? No, what actually happens is when that cheeseburger reaches your stomach, your stomach actually stretches as a result of that. And that stretch stimulates the muscle cells to contract on their own. We don't actually even have to tell it what to do. It's able to make those kind of basic decisions on its own. But remember, this wasn't the only place we found smooth muscle. Remember, for instance, we found smooth muscle in our erector pili muscles. We find smooth muscles inside of our eyes that change our focus or change the diameter of our pupil and things like that. And that type of smooth muscle is what is called multi-unit. Multi-unit is more similar to in organization, let's say it that way. In organization and function to skeletal muscle. It is bound together in bundles, not quite a fascicle, but it's bound in bundles that are at least like fascicles. And just like muscle cells in a fascicle, each cell needs input from the nervous system. So we need a motor unit to get it to do its job. No gap junctions, 
So one cell can't tell the next one what's going on. Instead, if we want them to work together as a single unit, excuse me, if we want them to work together, we need to innervate all of them with a motor unit to be able to get that to do that. Now, again, my artistic skills, as you know, are truly amazing. And that looks exactly like what it looks like in the body. But all right, we got to give our artists their due. They get paid for this stuff. So here we see an example of their illustration of that single unit. And again, uh, just a small input and then gap junctions connect and coordinate the activity of this, where here's that loose bundle of like director pili muscles where each muscle needs its own individual input from motor units. All right, now let's come here. When we look closer at the microscopic anatomy, we have a problem. This is smooth muscle. That means it has no stripes. And being the smart, sophisticated students that you are now, you now know that if there are no stripes, that means there's no sarcomeres because it is those sarcomeres and the arrangement of the sarcomeres that give it its stripes. And of course, if there's no sarcomeres, there's no myofibrils. But we still need our smooth muscle cell to contract. So obviously they're still going to have contractile proteins. They're still going to have regulatory proteins. They're still going to have structural proteins, but they're gonna be arranged in a different fashion. Here's a pretty nice picture uh, from your textbook, but let's go ahead and draw a simplistic version of this. And I'm gonna to totally cheat by just rather than drawing a spindle, I'll just use my diamond shape here for the drawing. I'm also, we know there's a large centrally located nucleus, but I'm not gonna bother drawing that uh, for right now um, so that we can talk about this. Here is our smooth muscle cell. Now, one of the things we know about it is no myofibrils. Uh, but as it turns out also, there is basically little to no sarcoplasmic reticulum. What does that tell us? Doesn't contract, not storing calcium. Right, exactly. No sarcoplasmic reticulum means that it doesn't have as much stored calcium inside of it. So this is gonna rely much more from extracellular calcium to do the wonky thing, oops. That is our contraction. Now, one of the ways it does that is on its plasma membrane, there are these many invaginations, kind of similar to what we saw in the motor end plate, sort of but not really, but there are these many evaginations like these tiny little caves. And in fact, that's what they're called, the caviolae. These caviolae are basically, I hope I spelled that wrong. Ah. Caviolet uh, are basically these tiny little invaginations on the plasma of the plasma membrane of our smooth muscle cell, which basically are these nooks and crannies, kind of like an English muffin has nooks and crannies where it keeps the butter inside of it. Well, these basically store calcium outside the cell. So instead of having to rely on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we have these caviolet on the outer surface that are going to store our calcium, keeping the calcium nearby 
so that we can get it when we need it for the contraction. Now, it has myosin and actin. Those are our regulatory proteins. And uh, let's go ahead and do this. Here's our myosin. Actually, let's do it as a line because I like that better. Here's our myosin. One of the interesting things about the myosin, as we know, myosin has myosin heads on them. And as we know, typically the myosin heads in a skeletal muscle point away from the M line. I mean, away from, yeah, away from the M line towards the Z disc. But that's not the case with the myosin here in our smooth muscle. Our myosin here in the smooth muscle, basically on one side, it has myosin heads that point in one direction. And on the other side, it has myosin heads that point in the opposite direction. So it is a myosin with myosin heads that perform power strokes, but a slightly different arrangement. Now, obviously, it's got to have the actin to uh, pull on. So we need actin on one side and actin on the other side for it to pull on. But as we know, that actin needs to be anchored with something. Normally, it's attached and anchored to a Z disk. But that's not the case here. In the case here, there are these big proteins that are actually embedded into the plasma membrane. So I'm going to cheat a little bit. My scale is a little off on this, but we'll make it work. There are these large proteins that are embedded into the plasma membrane of the cell known as the dense bodies. And part of the cytoskeleton and that part of the cytoskeleton uh, that is our intermediate filaments connect these dense bodies together. There'd be another one there, and there'd be more there in this kind of mesh-like structure. So we have these dense bodies and these intermediate filaments. That are the structural proteins that help to organize and coordinate the contraction of this smooth muscle cell. So when stimulated, our muscle cell, as we know, is irritable and it produces a muscle action potential. Oh, I guess I should have said over here, no transverse tubules. And of course, if no transverse tubules and no large sarcoplasmic reductum, of course, that means no triad either. So when stimulated, as we know, it's going to produce a muscle action potential. And our cell depolarizes. When our cell depolarizes, voltage-gated calcium channels on the sarcolemma 
open and calcium enters the cell. Calcium is going to move those regulatory proteins. And when it moves those regulatory proteins, our myosin and actin can interact. So all of that sounds familiar, but what's different is what happens next. So our myosin and actin are going to start to interact. Our myosin is going to grab onto this actin and start pulling this actin this way. It's gonna grab on this actin and pull this actin this way, which of course means the dense body moves towards the center. This dense body moves towards the center here. Similar to what we saw happening with our sarcomeres, like a sarcomere would get shorter. But notice this dense body is connected to intermediate filaments. So when this gets pulled towards the middle, it's pulling on this dense body. And this one, pulling them this way. And this one's pulling this one and this one. And this one is now getting pulled this way. So it's gonna pull on its neighbors who are then gonna pull on their neighbors. And this one's getting pulled this way and that way. And notice in this fashion, what ends up happening is as this muscle cell contracts, we get this twisting and bulging of the muscle cell. So because of the angular relationships, of the intermediate filaments and the dense bodies. Yes, the muscle cell gets shorter, but it also twists and bulges as a result. Now, does this sound nearly as efficient of a contraction as what we see in skeletal muscle? No, this is a very slow and weak contraction process. However, the advantage of it is it is very efficient. Notice by just having one myosin pulling on these two actins, I'm changing the shape of this muscle cell. And so again, very small amount of ATP can be used to maintain this contraction. So this contraction can be maintained for a much longer period of time. It is incredibly fatigue resistant where just a small amount of ATP can sustain this contraction for a prolonged period of time. Now, again, I've truly done an amazing job of drawing this here, but let's take a look at the pretty picture from your textbook. Notice here are caviolet, those small little caves that contain the um, calcium. Notice here we have our dense bodies and the intermediate filaments interlocking them. Notice we don't see the myosin and the actin in between, but we know the myosin and the actin are here in between. So again, we have our myosin, we have actin, no sarcomeres, no transverse tubules, right? Very little sarcoplasmic reticulum, but we do have those anchor points for the actin, the dense bodies. We do have those intermediate filaments, our cytoskeletal proteins that hold and bind these together. When the cell contracts, as I mentioned, our dense body is gonna get pulled towards the middle. And as it does, it pulls on its neighbors, which of course then pulls on its neighbors. And so we get this twisting and rotating and bulging of the muscle cell as it contracts. Again, it is an incredibly slow process. 
can be as much as 30 times slower than the contraction of a skeletal muscle, but it is highly efficient where it can be maintained for a much, much longer period of time with a much smaller amount of ATP. And as was mentioned earlier, rhythmic contractions of these layers, circular layer, longitudinal, circular, longitudinal, circular, longitudinal, this rhythmic contraction of the layers in our hollow organs propels things through them and we call that process peristalsis. All right, questions on that? All righty, that is all we need to know for smooth muscle. So let's switch gears and talk about cardiac muscle. Tell me the things you know about cardiac muscle. Striated. Striated, excellent. And now we know more about that as well. Striated, we now know means that it has sarcomeres. And that means it has myofibrils. And the good news about that is that also means it basically uses the same contraction process as skeletal muscle. So we don't have to learn anything new. There's no twisting and turning that way. It's going to be, well, let's really change the word there to similar. It's gonna be similar, not identical, but they are similar. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. When, what else do we know about it? Branched shape. Branched shape. What else? Doesn't regenerate. Doesn't regenerate. What else? Involuntary. Involuntary. And in fact, how is it controlled? Autorhythmic. Yeah. It's autorhythmic, right? Produces its own ATP. I mean, uh, its own uh, action potentials. However, as we do know, it can be modified with our autonomic nervous system and our hormones. Excellent. Got it out of room here, so I'll just keep this over here. What else? One nucleus and sometimes binucleated. Yeah, primarily uninucleated, or a very few will have two. Excellent. Anything else? Oh, I can think of one more. Actually, I can think of two more. Gap junctions. Excellent. So uh, the cells, so let's say this, the cells are connected by a special structure we call an intercalated disc. And you're right, that intercalated disc contains gap junctions, which allow it to work together as one. And what else does it contain? Desmosomes. And desmosomes, excellent. Excellent, that again, lock them together tightly so that they don't let go. And I can think of at least one more thing. Actually, I lied, I can think of two more things. Found in the heart only. Oh, there you go, Sam has got that. And then there you go, you provided that as well. Found only in the heart. And of course, what's the last thing? The last thing we know about, oh, we said that already. I'm sorry, does it regenerate? Never mind. 
That's why you're all looking at me confused because we hit it already. I didn't see it up there. Excellent. All right. Perfect. There you go. So those are all the things that we already know about it. Let's take a look at some things we haven't talked about yet. Notice here, we see that it absolutely positively has myofibrils and those myofibrils contain our uh, sarcomeres. So we have I bands and A bands and H bands and M lines and Z lines and all of those things. Notice the myofibrils don't push the nucleus to the side. So our nucleus is here smack dab in the middle. And it has lots of mitochondria, lots of mitochondria. As we talked about, uh, it vitally, vitally needs oxygen, a massive amount of oxygen to it. If deprived of oxygen for even a brief period of time, the cell can be damaged. So lots of mitochondria to deal with all of that oxygen. But notice there are some differences. It does have a transverse tubules and it does have some sarcoplasmic reticulum, but not a lot. Notice there's also no terminal cisternae. And so of course that means no triads. And what does that tell us? Not much calcium. Yeah, so again, like smooth muscle relies on extracellular calcium to move the regulatory proteins. Well, let's say it this way, it relies on more extracellular calcium to move regulatory proteins than skeletal muscle, which relies on almost none. Excellent, excellent. And so its muscle contraction mechanism is going to be similar, keyword there of course being similar to what we've learned in our skeletal muscle. Now, while the contraction is similar, the action potential is very, very different. Let's look at this. Let's start by drawing some things we know. One of the things we know is about a skeletal muscle action potential. We know, here's our graph. Down here is of course time. Up here is voltage. And let's move this up here. Move all this over a little bit more. We know that a skeletal muscle cell, when left alone, will happily sit at its resting membrane potential. And what is that resting membrane potential of a skeletal muscle cell? Negative 70 millivolts. Excellent. So if left alone, it will happily stay there forever. However, if we can disturb it by making it more positive, and what do we call that process of making it more positive? Depolarization. Depolarization. And we can depolarize it to a particular point. And what is that particular point? Negative 60. Negative 60 millivolts. And what do we call that particular point? 
if we can get it to threshold, we know it's going to produce a big, huge, massive positive signal. Big, huge, massive, rapid positive signal, which as we know is about a plus 100 millivolt change. However, this action potential, just as rapidly as it depolarized, it repolarizes back to rest. And as I think we talked about, the average speed of a muscle action potential of a skeletal muscle uh, action potential is somewhere around one to three milliseconds, somewhere in that range. And we know that that skeletal muscle action potential produces a skeletal muscle twitch. Which is again, something we can measure Time down here. Tension on our y axis this time. And we know that we cheat with our twitch, where we offset the twitch, the zero time of our twitch to when it produces that muscle action potential, because we know events have to occur first. And we know that a twitch has how many stages to it? Three. And what are they? Latent period. And how does the tension change during the latent period? Doesn't. Stay zero. It doesn't. Excellent. Then what do we have? Contraction period. And how does the tension change during that? Drastic. Increases. And then Increase. what happens? Relaxation. And how does the tension change during that? Decreases. Decreases, excellent, until it's back at rest. And if you remember, what did we say the average uh, time for a twitch was? Ten to twenty milliseconds. Actually, a little bit more than that, about forty milliseconds. Remember, you're right. Some can be as quick as seven milliseconds, but some can be as long as 100. All right. No new information here. This is what we've already learned, and we know, and we understand. And we can add one more thing to this as well. In a muscle cell, do we only produce, no, no, I want that to stay black because I want to do this. In a muscle cell, actually, I guess we should probably put this up here. We know that when a muscle cell is stimulated, there is a brief period of time where after it is stimulated, it loses its irritability. It loses its ability to produce a second action potential. And what did we call that period of time? The latent period? No, it wasn't the latent period, refractory period. There we go. You're right in that it mostly occurs during the latent period. But the refractory period, again, is the time where the muscle cell loses its irritability. And cannot fire a second action potential. And do you remember about how long that refractory period was? One to five milliseconds. Yeah, somewhere around 
one to five milliseconds. Excellent. So there you go. That is what we know about a skeletal muscle, its action potential, and a skeletal muscle twitch. Now, for our cardiac muscle, In our cardiac muscle, we have contractile cells. And guess what the contractile cells of our cardiac muscle does? I'm on a limb here, I'm gonna say contracts. There you go, exactly. Excellent, excellent. All right, some of the answers do actually get to be easy on occasion. Again, we are gonna look at time. We are going to look at voltage. A little smaller. And again, our cardiac muscle contractile cells have a resting membrane potential. Actually, I'm just going to abbreviate this time. They have a threshold, just like we see in our skeletal muscle. So the process starts the exact same way. We do depolarize the cell to threshold. When it reaches threshold, we get that rapid depolarization. We get that big, fast depolarization, just like we see in our skeletal muscle. However, then something different happens. Basically, there are three big changes that take place. We, uh, sodium stops entering the cell. Sodium is what makes the cell really, really positive. Potassium stops leaving the cell. But the, remember, our cardiac muscle also relies a lot more on extracellular calcium. Extracellular calcium enters the cell. And so these three events together combine to cause a prolonged depolarization. So this cardiac muscle cell, rather than happen a rapid one to three millisecond action potential, has a much longer action potential. And eventually, it goes back and depolarizes back to rest. So this action potential can be up to 15 times longer than in skeletal muscle. It is a much, much longer depolarization. Now, just like in skeletal muscle, a muscle action potential in our contractile uh, cardiac muscle cells that muscle action potential is going to produce a twitch. Professor, could you uh, bring that up? It's cut it's off right at the bottom. There? Is that high enough? Yes, thank you. Okay. Again, we are going to be measuring tension versus time. 
We are going to produce our muscle action potential. And as a result of that, we get a twitch. And the twitch has the exact same three stages, a latent period, a contractile phase, and a relaxation phase. So we get the same three phases, but not surprisingly, with a longer action potential, we get a longer twitch. In this case, the twitch can be somewhere around two, oops, that's not the around, around 200 milliseconds. It's a much, much longer contraction. So my question to you is why? Why a longer contraction from this uh, muscle action potential? Well, let me ask the question this way. How many of you have ever blown up an air mattress before? And I don't mean the way you do it now where you plug it into the wall and you push the button and, and it fills up. No, I mean out camping with a hand pump. Have you filled up an air mattress with a hand pump? Is that necessarily a fun activity? No. And so while you're doing it, do you take that pump and do a bunch of really fast, really short pumps of that air mattress to try to get the air moving as fast as possible? No. How do you use the air pump? Try to do as long strokes as possible. Yeah, big, long, sustained strokes, because those big, long, sustained strokes are more efficient at moving air. Well, your heart moves blood. And so when your heart's moving blood, do you want it making a bunch of very rapid, small contractions or long, sustained contractions for a more efficient pumping action? Longer. Yeah, you want that long sustained contraction because this makes it a more efficient pump. There you go. Oh, I thought I changed that to blue. Apparently I changed it back. So I'll highlight it in blue that way. Which brings us to that refractory period. Our cardiac muscle cell also has a refractory period. Remember the refractory period is the amount of time where the muscle cell loses its irritability and can't be uh, firing a second action potential and it can't form a second twitch. And our refractory period for our cardiac muscle cell is more than 250 milliseconds. What does that tell us? Don't want it overused. Okay, that's a good thought. Don't want it overused. How long is the actual contract? How much? How long is it producing tension for? Only two hundred milliseconds. Only two hundred milliseconds. When I move my arm through space. Do I just use one muscle action potential and one twitch to move my arm through space? No, I rapidly stimulate it and I add a whole bunch of twitches together. And what did we call that process? Wave summation. Wave summation. Wave summation is where you add tension together. Can I wave summate? my cardiac muscle? No. No, which means... It's all or nothing. Part of it is indeed it's all or nothing, but remember, when we're adding waves together, the goal is to tetanize the muscle. Get that muscle to produce that long, sustained, locked up contraction. Can we tetanize our cardiac muscle? Would we want to tetanize our cardiac muscle? No. no. 
So there's no wave summation here. There's no tetanus. Or let's say it this way, cannot tetanize cardiac muscle, which is a good thing. Could tetanus tetanize that? No, no because again, the ref because of the refractory period, you won't be able to add the waves together. So it wouldn't be able to affect it in the same way, which is why it only affects skeletal muscle. Excellent, so there you go. That's nice, let's go back here. So as we talked about, muscle action potential as much as 15 times longer. And now we know because it's getting that calcium from outside. Contraction length, like we talked about, the average for a skeletal muscle is about 40 milliseconds, but it can range anywhere really from 10 to 100 milliseconds, whereas our heart's going to be closer to 200 milliseconds and that much, much longer absolute refractory period. So we cannot tetanize the cardiac muscle. We cannot add waves together. Lastly, as we've talked about, because it has gap junctions, it's all going to work together as one. And since it's all going to work together as one unit, there's no need for motor units. We're not going to have motor units to it, uh, stimulating it the same way that we do with skeletal muscle. And then, like I said, we have those autorhythmic cells. And when you get to 431, and if you're taking 431 from me, we will actually start with the cardiovascular system and we'll start with the heart. And we'll learn then about the autorhythmic cardiac muscle cells, the ones that stimulate it and allow it to produce its own action potentials. All right, questions on that? All right, again, your book's got some nice tables that do a good job of talking about the different types of muscle cells and everything that goes along with that. And with that, I know I went a little long, but I wanted to get through it. This was all the material you are responsible for lecture. So we are done with all of the lecture material. Uh, so all we have to do now is to finish up the lab stuff. All right, questions? All right, if you don't have questions now, that is fine, but definitely think about them for the review. So we left off and we were working our way through the muscles of the legs. So let's switch gears back into lab mode. Um, I went a little long, so I'll give you all of two minutes extra here. Let's go ahead and take a break and come back. We will restart at uh, 9.45 and I will start the recording at that time. So go get some caffeine, something to eat, breakfast, whatever, and I will see you at 9.45. We'd gone through the two big muscle groups of the thigh, anterior and posterior, the hamstring and the quadricep femoris, but there are several other muscles uh, that we need to talk about as well. And the next two muscles I wanna talk about are the gracilis and the sartorius. Uh, again, these are muscles that I think it really helps if we look at the origins and insertions of them. So let's go ahead and go here and notice they're on the same picture. So let's start first with the gracilis. What is the origin of the gracilis? Inferior ring missing. Excellent. Notice the gracilis is basically the most medial muscle of the leg. And so not surprisingly, its origin is about as medial as you can get it, basically right next to the pubic symphysis. And what is its insertion? Inferior to medial condyle tibia. Yeah, notice down here onto the medial condyle of the tibia. And remember, if in fact, if you remember, oh, that's what we need to also get set up. We need our muscle pictures. So let's do that.
All right, so that one doesn't show up, but I believe mine does. So we've got the pictures from the Cosumnes River College site, and then we also have our modules. Sorry, I grabbed coffee and breakfast. So I did not get a chance to get all this set up ahead of time, which would have been good, but we're way ahead of schedule, so we're okay. And here's what I want. This will work. If you remember, on the medial aspect of the leg, we said that there was not one, not two, not three, but four muscles that all basically come and insert into that medial condyle of the um, tibia. We've just learned the gracilis is one of them. And what are the other two that we've already learned as well? Semi-membranosis and semi-tendinosis. Exactly. So the gracilis, the semimembranosis, the semitendinosis, and there's going to be one more that we're going to talk about in just a minute, and I'll give you a hint. It's the sartorius, which is the next muscle we we're just going to talk about. These are the four muscles that all go into that medial condyle. And as we talked about, it's not all perfectly the exact same location, but for this exam, you can simply say the medial condyle. And we know they're all basically in that medial condyle nook of our tibia. So here is our gracilis. As I mentioned, it is the most superficial, most medial muscle of the leg. It starts medial and it ends medial. It's this strap-like muscle on the medial aspect of the leg. Now, being a strap-like muscle, basically it grabs the knee and pulls it up, the lower leg and pulls it up. So it affects both the hip and the knee. And so not surprisingly, there are four actions that this muscle is responsible for. And let's go ahead and do this. I'm gonna cheat and give myself some space to write. You can do this on a separate piece of paper or something like that, but I can't switch back and forth without losing the image. So for the gracilis, what is the four actions? Let's start first with the knee. What is the effect that it has on the knee? Flexes the knee. Flexes the knee, excellent. What about the hip? Flexes the hip. Flexes the hip, excellent. So like I said, it collapses the leg up, brings the, uh, flexes the knee, flexes the hip. But what else does it do to the hip? Medially rotates the thigh. Being medial, it brings the femur, which is a lateral structure, medially inward. And one more thing. Adducts. Yeah, being a medial muscle, not surprisingly, it a D ducks the leg. So basically, it collapses. Uh, the leg and brings it inward. All right. Let's see how this compares to the sartorius. Sartorius is the longest muscle in the body. Notice longest doesn't necessarily mean strongest but it is the longest. And as we just finished talking about, it is going to be the fourth muscle that inserts into this medial condyle of the tibia. However, unlike the gracilis, which starts medial and ends medial, the 
making it a very medial mu muscle. Our sartorius starts lateral and ends medial. And being the longest muscle, we need probably the highest lateral part point we can find on this structure. So what is the origin of the sartorius? The anterior superior iliac spine. There you go. That anterior superior iliac spine. Again, this is a strap-like muscle that comes down the leg. And as it comes down the leg, as we'll see, it actually wraps around the head of the vastus medialis. That's way too big. To then come in on the medial aspect of the leg. Now, it crosses the same two joints that the gracilis does. So not surprisingly, on the knee, it is also going to flex the knee. On the hip, it is going to flex the hip. So again, it collapses the leg down. However, where the gracilis is medial, where it collapses the leg down and brings it inward, the sartorius collapses the leg down and brings it outward. So while it flexes the hip, what are the other two actions it has on the hip? Maybe duck. All right. And laterally rotate. A B ducks and laterally rotates. Anyone come up with a good activity for this Artorius to help us remember all these actions? The one I always use to remind me is what you would do or how you could cross your legs if you were wearing pants or wearing shorts, right? If you wanted to cross your legs, obviously you would flex the hip, flex the knee. You would then abduct the leg and by laterally rotating it, you would bring your foot up onto your knee. So the way you would cross your legs if you were wearing shorts or wearing pants is what the sartorius does. Flex the knee, flex the hip, abduct, and laterally rotate. For the gracilis, notice it's also flexing the knee and flexing the hip, but it's bringing the leg inward. Anyone have a good mnemonic to help us remember that one? Glad to see you guys put so much time and effort into your uh, muscle reviews that you turned in today that are graded for correctness. Let's take a look at the muscles here. Notice again, starting medially at the inferior angle and coming down into the uh, side of the knee is our gracilis. Whereas starting superior and lateral at the superior anterior iliac spine, wrapping around the head of the uh, vastus medialis and coming into the medial condyle is our sartorius. The sartorius, again, flexes the knee, flexes the hip, and then brings it out. Laterally rotates and medially rotates. Pardon me, laterally rotates and uh, abducts. The gracilis brings the legs in and medially rotates it. And I have a former student who is kind enough, like I said, I have students who I have to demonstrate this in class. And she demonstrated for us what she referred to as her fangirl pose. All right, so notice here, she is flexing her hip, she is flexing her, her knee, 
She is medially rotating her leg and she has abducted her legs. And by doing that, she is super excited at that BTS concert. All right. They're screaming butter and she screams in turn. So there you go. So it helps you fangirl or uh, someone else in the past has referred to this as kind of like what you do when you're doing your pee pee dance when you have to wait at that concert to get into the bathroom. All right, questions on that. Now, notice one more thing. We've been looking at this bodybuilder leg. Again, we've got our good anchor points. We're finding our vastus medialis, which is right next to the kneecap. Again, that patella, no matter how big the leg gets, is still the bone and doesn't change that way. We found that nice rectus femoris, and we even see the tendinous insertion in there. And notice as we talked about the sartorius, and I'll change colors to emphasize this, is a strap-like muscle that comes and wraps around the head of the vastus medialis. So it is actually a muscle that we can see nicely distinguished here on our bodybuilder. Notice I don't see the gracilis. Why don't I see the gracilis? Is it more deep? No, remember, it's the most medial muscle, so it is definitely superficial. And there is a muscle behind just deep to the gracilis. If we come back to this picture here, we'll get to that in a second. Notice again, here is our gracilis. Notice just deep to the gracilis. Oops, come on. Oh, here we go, an even better picture. Here is our gracilis. And just deep to the gracilis is a muscle group known as the adductors. Are you required to know all of the adductors? There are three of them, no. the adductor longus, the adductor brevis, and the adductor magnus. But all yeah. you're responsible for is the adductor magnus. You're not responsible for the entire adductor group. You're just responsible for the adductor magnus. In fact, it's one of the muscles you don't need to know the origins and the insertion of. However, we can clearly see it here because it is deep to uh, the uh, gracilis. And with a name like adductor magnus, guess what its primary function is? Adduct. Adducting the leg, adducting the leg. Now, for uh, consistency sake, does the adductor magnus do anything else? Yes. Yeah, what else does it do? Rotate and flex the, the thigh. Okay, rotate what direction? Medium. Medium. Medial rotation, excellent. So again, this is kind of like that roundhouse kick. You're flexing, you're bringing it inward and you're medially rotating it. Excellent. Now, notice as big as that bodybuilder's leg has gotten, we really can't distinguish the gracilis and the adductor magnus because they're primarily responsible for adducting the leg. And how do you usually adduct the leg? If you were standing upright right now and you swung your leg out to the side and then I told you to adduct it, what would you do? To bring it back. And would you really contract the muscle to bring it back down? Not really. What would you do? Use gravity. Yeah, you use gravity. Gravity pretty much adducts our legs for us. So it's not muscles that get necessarily a lot of tone in them. Now, if you go to the gym, is there a machine that will help you to strengthen your adductors? Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's this big, huge torture device that you have to get in and something you never make eye contact with anybody while you're on, right? But technically- No, you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> yes. yes, exactly. You're not supposed to. If you are, Brian, then please stop. <laughs> but um, absolutely, it's not something that works out a lot. And so even in these massive bodybuilders, there's not a lot of major tone on the inside of the leg. So on the inside of that bodybuilder leg, we really can't distinguish 
the gracilis and the, Sar and the adductor magnus in here. We can see the sartorius, but really nothing else over here. The reason I mention the adductor magnus here is because these are muscles that don't get worked out as much and don't have as much tone, they're more prone to be injured. And often in baseball, it's going on right now, or football or other sports, you will hear about uh, uh, athletes getting groin injuries. Right now, a groin injury isn't necessarily when we're talking about, you know, a baseball player taking a fall uh, ball in the cup, especially when he's not wearing a cup. But a groin injury, when people say groin injuries, typically, I would say 60 to 70 percent of the time they have a groin injury, it is a strain to the adductor magnus muscle. So this adductor magnus muscle is the one that is most commonly associated uh, with what we commonly refer to as a groin injury. And it's just because these muscles are harder to keep tone in because gravity pretty much does their job. All right. So that's our gracilis, that's our sartorius, and we jumped ahead to the adductor magnus because it was relevant. Questions on those three? All right, let's go to our next muscle group. This next muscle group is the iliopsoas. Iliopsoas is a muscle group made of two and a half muscles. The first of these muscles is known as the iliacus. And the iliacus, as its name might indicate, is lining the inner surface, the inner fossa of the ilium. The second is the psoas major. The psoas major, as you can see, and again, notice these are not origins and insertions you need to be aware of, but I want you to see them. The psoas major basically is a muscle group that originates from the lumbar vertebrae. And most people, although not everyone, also has a psoas minor, an additional muscle that for some people fuse with the psoas major. And so basically it becomes one muscle, but for some people it is a separate muscle. And these two and a half muscles together then extend under the inguinal ligament and come and attach to the front of the femur. And you don't have to worry about where, because again, we don't have to know the origins and insertions. But what I want you to see is the location of this. Notice, I think I've got the pictures of it. Here we go. This muscle originates inside of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Here we see the inside of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Here along the wall is the iliacus, our psoas major starting at the lumbar vertebrae, our psoas minor. And again, you don't need to know the individual muscles, but they collectively form the iliopsoas, which comes under the inguinal ligament and attaches to the front of the femur. How many actions does this muscle have? Just one. Just one, flexing the leg. As we've talked about, your leg is a big, huge, big mass of muscle. It's a big, heavy load that we need to be able to swing through space. So not surprisingly, we need a big solid base for this muscle. To give this muscle a solid anchor to swing that leg through space, notice it is attached to the inside of your pelvis and to your lumbar vertebrae. Two big, huge, strong, weight-bearing muscle, I mean bone structures. So by having this big, huge, solid anchor point, we're able to swing that leg through space. Now we see it really nicely on the inside of the torso here. But if we also look here, 
at the superior part of our model, notice we see that sartorius, we see that great rectus femoris with its bipennate muscle fascicles. We see our inguinal ligament. And lo and behold, here's the psoas major and minor, here's the iliacus. So here collectively, and then coming out underneath that inguinal ligament is our iliopsoas. Notice this iliopsoas helps to form along with the inguinal ligament and the sartorius, this region that is known as the femoral triangle. From a clinical standpoint, if you've ever worked as an EMT or an emergency room nurse or something like that, if someone comes in with major wound in, uh, leg injuries where they're losing a lot of blood and you're not able to put a tourniquet on it, what you do is you palpate this inguinal triangle. You take the palm of your hand and you push the palm right on there because that squeezes, notice the femoral artery and vein that come out there and you can limit the blood loss. However, notice sitting right next to those blood vessels is the femoral nerve. And if you are too vigorous with your pushing, yes, you can stop the blood loss and keep them alive, but you could potentially crush the femoral nerve. And so good news, they live, bad news, they limp. And of course, because of the litigious society we, we live in, right? if they've got a limp now, they're of course going to sue you. So of course, make sure everybody signs a waiver before you save their life. Good Samaritan right. Act, no? Good Samaritan I'm sorry? Act? The Good Samaritan Act, isn't that? <laughs> well, it depends. If, if it's just you doing that, then yes, you can kind of get away with that. If, uh, if, it, if you're a, a registered medical uh, uh, expert, right? Like a nurse or a doctor or something like that, then that's good Samaritan thing doesn't count, right? Isn't that how that works? All right. Like I can throw a punch, but if I'm a karate expert, then my hands are suddenly deadly weapons, right? So again, there are exceptions to all of those types of rules. So again, safest thing is either A, get them to sign a waiver or just let them die. <laughs> all right. Questions on that? Dead bodies don't tell tales. There you go. Exactly. All righty. So, Again, don't need to know the individual muscles. You just need to know them collectively. You don't need to know uh, their origins and their insertions, but kind of like we saw with the rotator muscles, where they're located in the bones really tells us a ton about them. This is a muscle group that is anchored to the pelvis, anchored to the lumbar vertebrae, these big, large, strong, stable bone structures because they got to swing that huge, hunk of meat that leg through space. All right. You did the inguinal ligament. We did the adductor magnus. Let's go back to that superior anterior iliac spine. Notice again, this is not a muscle we need to know the origin and the insertion of. But Notice again, there's that inguinal triangle we just finished talking about. Here is that sartorius we were talking about. Here's the rectus femoris. And notice the rectus femoris sits between these V-like structures formed by the sartorius on this side and a muscle we talked a bit about in the last class, and that is the tensor fascia laudia. The tensor fascia laudia is an anterior and lateral muscle. It's a small little anterior and lateral muscle on the anterior lateral aspect of the leg, which even though we don't need to know the origin and the insertion, as we see, basically attaches to the uh, iliotibial band. And again, I think that picture we have does, we've got a picture that does a great job of showing it. There we go. Excellent. So here we very nicely see that iliotibial band. 
And here, even though we really can't see its starting point as well, this, you'll have to just take my word for it, is the superior anterior iliac spine. And so coming from that, we have this month's muscle on the anterior, on the lateral aspect of the leg. called the tensor fasciolata. As we mentioned in the last class, its job is to put tension on the IT band so that it helps to work with that pressure cuff to stabilize the fasciolata on the leg, to stabilize these big, huge, powerful muscles, and to help to draw blood back towards the heart. However, it is an accessory muscle. Obviously a tiny little muscle like this isn't gonna be a major muscle in the movement of the legs, but it is an accessory muscle and its location tells you everything about it. Being an anterior muscle, what is the function of this muscle going to be? Flex an abductor spine. Yeah, and in this case, because it's anterior, it's gonna flex the hip, absolutely. And because it is lateral, as you mentioned, it is going to a b duct the hip or the leg. Again, you could think of it either way. So its location tells you everything about it. On this um, slide presentation I have, I don't have uh, the right picture for it. However, if the view of this picture was a little higher and our bodybuilder wasn't wearing these pesky shorts, right? Because often, as you see, they've got those tidy little uh, whitey type uh, uh, outfits that they wear in the workout. Uh, you can actually see the very beginning of the uh, tensor fasciolata. This tensor fasciolata can actually become quite prominent. I think we go way back, I think my female bodybuilder picture. No, not him. Where was that female bodybuilder picture? Oh, it was the gastrocnemius, I think. Do, 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 do. All right, hold on. I got to stop and find it. You passed. I think you're right. Yeah, I did pass the arm. But rather than doing this, let's go. Yeah, it's not great, but it'll work. I wouldn't use this example on the exam. I would use an even more obvious example. But if you do look closely, you can actually see up here this muscle that is sticking out. This small little anterior lateral muscle is that uh, tensor fasciolata. And again, some of these bodybuilders, it's like a boil sticking out on the side of the leg. It is incredibly impressive how uh, large this tiny little bundle of fascicles can become because it's this little parallel muscle and as we know, they bulge with contraction. Uh, so it can become quite prominent and obvious. So we see it nice on her with the high-waisted uh, 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 outfit. And like I said, our other bodybuilder, the leg bodybuilder has got those pesky pants in the way. Uh, but uh, there are plenty of pictures that you can find where uh, you'll be able to see. You can see the very hint of it starting to stick out from here. And like I said, it can be quite prominent. So again, neither of these pictures would be the kind of pictures I'd use on the exam. But I'm sure if you do a web search of bodybuilder pictures, make sure you have your uh, child uh, um, security thing on when you're doing that. And uh, you can see some nice examples of that. All right. So we did that. 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 Excellent. So I think with that, we are done with the thigh. Any questions on any of the muscles we're responsible for on the upper leg? I think we've hit all of them. Have we hit all of them? We went a little out of order, but I think we hit all of them. Excellent. Then all we have to do to finish things up is talk about the muscles of the lower leg. Starting first with a muscle known as the gastrocnemius. Now, remember we have the bicep brachia and the bicep femoris. 
And while they were similar in name, they weren't very similar in function and they weren't very similar in their organization. However, here, as you look at the gastrocnemius, you'll see it is very similar in shape and function to the bicep femoris. Notice for starters, we have two bellies to this muscle and these two bellies are side by side. Any idea how we identify the two bellies? Medial and lateral. Medial and lateral, so even easier than long and short. Notice like the bicep brachia, it is a superficial muscle that sits on top of the bone, in this case on the tibia. And like the bicep brachia, where you do the curls for the girls so you can have that nice, big, impressive bicep muscle, that's the same thing with your gastrocnemius, right? What we commonly refer to as the calf muscle, right? Everybody likes to have a nice, big, prominent calf muscle. And sure, you could work out to get that nice, big, prominent calf muscle. But if you weren't happy with the size of your calf muscle, there are actually calf implants that you can buy. Back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean the 90s, there was an amazing football player who played for the Cincinnati Bengals by the name of Chad Johnson. Chad Johnson went a little crazy, changed his name to Ocho Cinco because his name was 85, and that's not how you say 85 in Spanish, but he was quite an amazing character. Uh, when he was in Cincinnati, he was one of the fastest uh, uh, wide receivers in the league. In fact, he once raced a uh, horse because uh, they have a, a, a really nice uh, horse racing track there in Cincinnati. He raced a horse for charity and beat it. So he was incredibly fast, incredibly powerful. And one of the things he was known for were these amazingly impressive gastrocnemius muscles. His calf muscles were amazing. And there was actually a company that at the time paid him half a million dollars to make a mold of his calf muscles so they could make calf implants. So that if you didn't have the calves of, of Chad uh, Johnson, you could get the calf muscles of Chad Johnson for, I'm sure, whatever the nominal fee for that kind of plastic surgery is. So big, prominent, superficial muscle sits out on top. And there's one other big way that it's similar to the bicep brachia. And let's look at the bones to figure out what that is. Remember, the bicep brachia sits on top of the humerus but does it actually connect to the humerus? No. No. The gastrocnemius is this big two-bellied muscle that sits right on top of the tibia. Our lateral head, is, I mean, our medial head is medial. Our lateral head is lateral. But let's look at the origin. What is the origin of the medial head? Medial condyle of femur. Excellent. Now notice, we know that medial condyle is that big knuckle-like structure, but we also know that is where it forms the joint of the knee. So it's not going to be on the smooth surface, but right above the smooth surface. And if we were in the classroom and had a femur in front of us, we would see that on the condyle right above the knuckle is this little roughened attachment point. And so that little rough and attachment point is the origin of the medial head. And not surprisingly, the lateral head sits on the lateral condyle. And these two combine into the same insertion. And what is the insertion of the gastrocnemius? Calcineus. Calcaneus, the heel bone. So notice, like the bicep brachia, it sits on top of a bone, in this case, the tibia, but it doesn't actually connect to it. It originates above the tibia on the femur. It inserts below the tibia on the calcanus. Now, because of this, it crosses two joints. Being a posterior muscle, what is its effect on the knee going to be? Flex the knee. 
Flex the knee, excellent. And now we gotta talk about the ankle. Uh, here, let's over here, draw the bones real quickly of the ankle. We know the ankle basically is comprised of that C clamp that is the medial malleolus and the lateral malleolus. So here we see the lateral malleolus and here we see the medial malleolus and they form this C clamp that the talus sits in. So there's that tall talus that then connects basically to the rest of the foot. The calcanus and then the rest of the foot from there. In the ankle, basically, we have two types of muscles. We have muscles that attach in front of the C clamp, that is the uh, medial and lateral malleolus. And we have muscles that insert behind the C clamp. If you attach behind, when the muscle contracts and pulls up, notice that pulls the heel up, which brings the foot down. And what type of action would that be? Enter flexion. There you go. That would be the plantar flexion, which would allow us to stand on our tippy toes. If instead you attached to the front of that C clamp, when the muscle contract and pulled it up, the toes would go up and the heel would stay down. And what type of action would that be? Flexion. Excellent. So the same way we know anterior muscles flex and posterior muscles extend, except the knee. We know this relationship now with the ankle. Muscles that attach behind the ankle joint are going to plantar flex. Muscles that attach in front are gonna dorsal flex. And this one, of course, attaches behind the knee because it's here on the back. So what action is that going to be? Plantar flex. Plantar flexion, exactly. So our gastrocnemius flexes the knee and plantar flexes the foot. Where do you see the activity of this muscle a lot? Driving. True, absolutely driving would be one of the places where, right, absolutely, as we talked about, uh, when you're stepping on the gas. Although hopefully you're not flexing your knee too much, although I guess you don't have your legs straight out when you're driving either. You need to flex your knee to get it down to the gas pedal. So maybe, I guess you guys live a different life than I do. I, here in my house, have a wife, have two daughters, have two female dogs, and as I speak, uh, my wife and youngest may be out looking at a female cat to bring into the house. So not surprisingly, the Hallmark Channel is on a ton in my house. And what happens at the end of every Hallmark movie? A kiss is. And not just any kiss, but you have the true love kiss. And how do you know it's the true love kiss? Because the knee bends and toe point. There you go. And that's your gastrocnemius. That gastrocnemius flexes the foot and points the toe, giving you that true love kiss that lets you know they are going to live happily ever after. All right. Now, let's look at one more thing in our pretty picture here. Notice again, we clearly have those two nice bellies. And what I really like about this picture is notice here in the deep view, when they've removed a bunch of the muscles at the top, we can actually see those origins of the two heads. They've cut the bellies themselves, but we can see that lateral and medial head, how they attach to the condyles, but above the knuckles of the knee. But the other thing we see is this big, huge, prominent tendon. This is the strongest tendon 
in the body. And what is it known as? Achilles tendon. It is the calcaneal tendon, but you're right. The term Achilles tendon is completely ubiquitous. And of course, where does that term Achilles tendon come from? Uh, is it Greek mythology? Yeah, in Greek Achilles. mythology, there's a Greek hero by the name of Achilles, who is the uh, son of a water nymph. Uh, to protect Achilles, she took him, and depending on which version you uh, read, she either dipped him into the river Styx or she dipped him into fire, uh, with the point of making his skin invulnerable. However, to dip him into that, she had to hold him by the heel, and so that was the one place that didn't come in contact, the one place he was vulnerable. And during the Trojan War, he was shot with an arrow into that invulnerable spot and died as a result of it. So again, because that back of the foot, that heel a region is the Achilles heel, uh, we call this the Achilles tendon. And I will accept the term Achilles tendon if for no other reason than it's harder to spell than calcaneal. So calcaneal tendon and Achilles tendon, I will accept either of those. And as I mentioned, it is the strongest tendon. Has anybody here, hopefully nobody here has torn their Achilles tendon. Has anybody here torn their Achilles tendon? Has anybody been around somebody when they tore an Achilles tendon? Brian, did you hear it? How far away were you from the person when it happened? A uh, good 30, 40 yards. Did you hear it? it was on, a, on a football field, yeah. Yeah, see, 40 yards away and he still heard it. It is a loud snap. It sounds like a gunshot. When you talk to people who have the Achilles, they often sometimes say they feel like they were shot because they heard a loud bang and then suddenly they were on the ground. There is so much tension in this tendon that when it tears, it is a catastrophic injury and it can be quite loud when it occurs. And healing of it is then very challenging as well. Again, this is a dense regular connective tissue where all the collagen fibers are all projecting in one direction. And so when it tears, because some stress has come at an angle to that, or they twisted their ankle, or they were tackled from the side, or something along those lines, and that scar tissue forms, it can be very, very challenging. Uh, for many years, it was basically an injury that you had and you never recovered from. And then as uh, sports medicine got better, uh, typically there was a two to three year recovery time. And now well, you see with some running backs and wide receivers, they're back in, you know, 10 to 12 uh, months from this. So we are still getting better, but it is still an incredibly uh, devastating and damaging injury when it occurs. And it's again, it can be traumatic even just to be around it. Uh, because you can hear it when it occurs and it's pretty devastating. The muscle kind of balls up in the back, kind of like one of those old uh, uh, wind shades that rolls up inside of it. It's again, it's, uh, it can be a fairly uh, intense injury when it occurs. All right, questions on that? Excellent. And if that wasn't enough, there is yet one more way that the gastrocnemius is like the bicep brachia. The bicep brachia is the superficial muscle on top that gets all the credit, gets all the attention. But as we learned, there is a deep muscle beneath it, broader and flatter, that helps it do its job. In the arm, that's the brachialis. And here in the leg, that muscle is the soleus. The soleus gets its name because it is a broad, flat muscle, kind of like a sole fish is a broad, flat fish. However, notice the posterior compartment of your lower leg is a small compartment. There is not room for a big, huge, broad, flat muscle to sit flat. So instead, as this picture shows really nicely, our soleus is basically this broad fat, flat muscle that is folded up into this posterior compartment. And so here we see it cut. And then notice here, deep to the gracilis along the sides, we can see a little bit of that soleus sticking out deep beneath it as well. 
Again, if we look at the drawing of its origin insertion, we can see how it's just underneath the gastrocnemius, but has different origins and insertions. Well, at least different origins. What is the origin of the soleus? Head and proximal shaft of the fibula. And? And superior tibia. Basically, it is this U-shape origin on the posterior part of the tibia and the fibula. And we saw that in the cup muscle. It has this nice U-shape. And where does it insert? In the top tendon. Yeah, it actually also inserts using the Achilles tendon. In fact, I think, let me cheat and see. We have it here. Well, let's just look together. There we go. Perfect. If you look closely, and again, this isn't necessarily the view I would use on the exam, but what we see right here is this is that superficial uh, gastrocnemius on top and connecting to the Achilles tendon down here. But notice deep to it is this broad flat muscle that also uses the calcaneal tendon to attach the calcaneus. Notice there's a little gap between the rest of the muscles and the heel where both the soleus and the gastrocnemius attach to that calcaneus. So both the soleus and the gastrocnemius use the Achilles tendon to attach to the calcaneal bone. All right, so that shows that nicely. I've lost my picture, but we can quickly draw it again. Origin. insertion. It sits here under the gastrocnemius, but unlike the gastrocnemius, how many joints does it cross? One. Just one. So what is its one action? Plantar flex. Plantar flex, allowing us to stand up on our tippy toes. And again, when you're standing on your tippy toes, basically you're putting the entire weight of your body onto that very small part of the bones, right? And so that's why we need these big powerful leg muscles and this super strong tendon to be able to basically hold our weight up while we're standing on our tippy toes. And so not surprisingly, the gastrocnemius doesn't do that by itself. It has this big flat strong muscle, the soleus underneath it to help with that action. All right, questions on that. All right, much like we did with the upper leg, we go from the posterior compartment to the anterior compartment. And notice there isn't really much of an anterior compartment. Of course, you kind of knew this already because anyone who's ever walked around in the dark and bumped into a low coffee table knows it hurts like heck because you bang that unprotected shin bone right into that coffee table. That unprotected shin bone is basically the diaphysis of the tibia. So notice there's not a real a large anterior compartment to our lower leg. In fact, there's really only one prominent anterior muscle. And that one prominent anterior muscle, as the name indicates, is the tibialis anterior. Here we see the tibialis anterior on the front, but to truly appreciate it and what it does, we need to look at its origin and its insertion. What is the origin of the tibialis anterior? Lateral condyle and proximal shaft of tibia. 
Yeah, notice it basically originates over here. If you haven't figured it out, there's a whole heck of a lot of stuff going on on our tibia. If you think about it, there's clearly no room for this tibialis anterior to attach to the tibial tuberosity because how many muscles insert into the tibial tuberosity? Four. What are they? Rectus femoris, vastus intermedius, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis. Excellent. There is no room for the tibialis anterior over here under the medial condyle of the tibia, because how many muscles insert into there? Also four. Also four. What are they? Semimembranosus, semitendinosus, gracilis, and sartorius. There you go. So our tibia is pretty much already chalk filled. So the only place there's room for our anterior muscle is, yes, it's anterior, but it's here on the lateral side. So over here on the lateral condyle uh, and down the lateral aspect of the diaphysis is where the tibialis anterior begins. But where does it insert? Medial cuneiform and first metatarsal. And not just the medial cuneiform and the first metatarsal, but on the under surface, the inferior surface of those, on the underside. So notice basically what our tibialis anterior does is it starts lateral and basically wraps around the front of the leg and comes up underneath. We've drawn the origin insertion here, but now that we know what we're looking at, let's go back to the picture. Here, we see, again, on the, not on the, the, not on the tibial tuberosity, not over here lateral, but over here on the lateral condyle of the tibia and the diaphysis, but it comes down medially to the underside of the foot. So anterior muscle crosses the ankle, comes in front of our C-clamp that is the medial and lateral malleolus. So what is the obvious action of the tibialis anterior going to be on the foot? Dorsiflexion. Right, dorsiflexion, bringing it up. But notice as we talked about, it starts lateral and comes and inserts onto the underside of the medial foot. So when it pulls the foot up, it also is going to turn the foot so that the sole of the foot points medially. And what did we call that action? Inversion. Yeah. Inversion. So notice this dorsiflex and inverts the foot. Now, you may not have thought of the tibialis anterior before, but many of you are very, very well aware of it. Because as we've talked about, there are connective tissue fascias that wrap around muscles inside the different compartments of our body. All of our flexors of our elbow are wrapped up by our fascias. The extensors of our elbows are wrapped up by our fascias. Our whole thigh is wrapped up by a fascia. And the muscles of the anterior compartment of the lower leg are also wrapped up by the fascia. The problem is that's one muscle. So the tibialis anterior happens to have a connective tissue fascia that wraps around it and stabilizes it in place. As we know, of course, fascias are made up of dense irregular connective tissues. 
And do those necessarily have elasticity and give to them? No. Not really. And as we know, muscles, when they work out, they swell because they get an increased blood flow. They inflame from the damage that is being done to them, right? They increase with all of those things. And so as we start running and our muscle fills with blood and our muscle swells, for some individuals, this tibialis anterior muscle, uh, as it swells inside of that fascia, isn't able to expand. And as a result, the muscle becomes congested with blood. And as it becomes congested with blood, we can't get as much oxygen to it. We can't get as much nutrients to it. We can't get as much waste away from it. And as the lactic acid builds up inside of it, it can start to become very, very painful where it feels like it may actually rip off of your leg. And what do we actually call that condition? Shin splints. Shoot, shin splints is actually more damage to the bone. What do we call this condition? Oh, shin splints. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, shin splints is what uh, I don't know what I was thinking there. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, absolutely. Shin splints, right? So you get that pain. Hurts. Yeah, hurts a it lot. hurts like heck. Absolutely. It hurts like heck. So how do you resolve it? You stop. <laughs> True. Okay. Yes, you could stop running. But what if you wanted to run? What if you needed to run? Sack up and keep going. True. And again, there are ways you can, again, we get those shin splints as a result of it. One of the things that can help to resolve it is stretching beforehand. The problem of the problem is that restriction of the connective tissue. With enough stretching of the muscle, we can loosen that connective tissue so that it won't be as, um, it won't be as constrictive when you're running and when the muscle inflames, right? Yes, with more use, it will stretch out and can loosen and accommodate. So often uh, for people who have shin sprints, they do it the first couple of times they run, but after running again for a week or so, it'll start to go away. But there are some individuals that no matter how much they stretch and no matter how much they continue to exercise, it never goes away. In some of those extreme conditions with some uh, professional athletes and stuff like that, they will actually go in and make an incision in that fascia. Again, this is not a common procedure that, uh, that people do, but in some cases uh, uh, they will make a surgical incision to try to release some of the tension from that fascia. And for some individuals that can actually resolve uh, the shin splints issue. So there you go. So you may not have ever thought of that in tibialis anterior before, but if you've ever, after sitting on the couch for six months, decided to get up and run three miles, uh, then you probably have dealt with shin splints before. All right, questions on that? All right, the good news is that is the last muscle you need to know the origin and the insertion for, but there are two other muscles that we are responsible for. And as always, we want to look at the location and we want to look at their tendon. The first of these, as you see here, is a muscle that is very lateral on the lateral aspect of the leg, our peroneal region, or what is also known as the fibular region because that is where our fibula is located. And notice this muscle has a relatively small belly, but a long tendon that actually goes behind the lateral malleolus and attaches to the underside of the foot. This of course is the fibularis longus and our tendon tells us what it does. Being a lateral muscle connecting to the lateral aspect of the foot, it's going to pull the foot laterally. And what would we call that action? Uh, eversion. Eversion, exactly. And notice it goes behind the 
lateral malleolus. So does it bring the heel up or does it bring the toe up? Toe up. Toe up. Toe up? Yeah. Heel. Heel up. It goes behind the, metal, the, the, the lateral malleolus, so it brings the heel up. So this one is going to plantar flex and evert the foot. Lastly, and notice in between the two muscles, we really don't see the tibialis anterior on this one here, but we do see it over here. So notice here is that fibularis longus on the lateral aspect. Here is our tibialis anterior. And here in between it is a muscle whose belly doesn't tell us a whole heck of a lot. But if we follow its tendon, lo and behold, its tendon splits to go to the digits of the foot. What does that look an awful lot like? To have a muscle whose tendons go to different digits. With the uh, extensor digitorum? Extensor digitorum in the arm. However, to get to the foot, it has a much longer tendon. So it gets a longer name. It's the extensor digitorum longus. So we have the extensor digitorum in the arm and the extensor digitorum longus in the leg. Notice its tendon comes down to the front of the ankle and out to the digits of the feet. So what are the actions of the extensor digitorum longus going to be? Dorsiflexion of foot and extend phalanges. There you go dorsiflexion of the foot and extends the phalanges. And there you go. Just that easily, we have identified all the muscles, all the actions, all the origins, and all the insertions you are responsible for on this next exam. And that is everything you need to know. All right, let's go ahead and take one more break. We'll come here. We'll take a quick 15 minute break because like I said, I went a little long in the first one. So I want to give you guys a good second break. Uh, so uh, let's come back at, uh, that'll be 11.10. Uh, and at 11.10 restart, we will start with our Q&A review. Again, this is not me telling you the things that I think are important. This is you asking me questions to help you to be successful, things you're not understanding from the lecture or from the lab. Remember, if you don't ask questions, I assume you've all mastered the material and I make the tests harder. So I'm sure with the test in two days, you guys should have plenty of questions about the process or more hopefully about the content. Uh, so we'll take a quick break, quick stretch, quick caffeine, uh, and then we'll meet back here at 11.10 to do our review. All right, any questions? Uh, All right, see you in 15 minutes.